Every year, my town hosts a carnival, carousels, fair games, hall of mirrors, and that stupid twirly swing ride that makes you want to vomit. They really pull out all the stops for this one weekend in October. Growing up, I would get sugar sick, as my mom liked to call it, from all the cotton candy and funnel cakes. I'd only feel the symptoms after the night was done, while laying in bed, clutching my prizes. I ignored the pain and played back all the festivities in my head. I skipped the carnival now, it doesn't do anything for me anymore. So imagine my dismay as my girlfriend, who helps work the carnival, dragged me along one night after all the crowds had left. No lines, she squealed. I even know how to turn on the ferris wheel. I tried to look excited. She yanked me over to the shooting gallery, and we sat down in front of a counter lined with water pistols. Several bullseye targets hung about 15 feet away. We fired away, but of course, I let her win. I jumped the counter and make my way over to the prize rack. Huge stuffed animals, baseball caps, and t-shirts line the wall. Which one do you want? I yelled back. Hmm. She tried to look like she was making a life-altering decision. I'll admit now, it was kind of cute. Before choosing, I see her whip out her cell phone and snap a picture of me next to the prizes. I'm stuck between picking you or the stuffed octopus next to the clown head doll. I'll take the octopus. I rolled my eyes and reached past the clown head doll for the octopus. From there, she pulled me over to the carousel. I watched her disappear into the engineer's control room, and a few seconds later the pipe organ started and the carousel cranked into motion. During the ride, she felt it was time for another picture. I really tried to smile this time. We only stayed in the Hall of Mirrors for a few minutes. It was pitch black in there. We kept bumping into the mirrors and each other. Of course she snapped a picture in there too. The blinding flash didn't help our disorientation. After the terrifying Hall of Mirrors situation, we decided to leave. She told me she was going to go home and post pictures of the great night. The next morning I got on Facebook and noticed the small album she uploaded. I started reading through the comments. Lucky bastards, carnival all to yourself, nice. What caught me off guard were the next comments. Love the photobombing clown. Who is that dressed up as the clown? Wait, what? I look through the pictures again, and sure enough, there it is. In the carousel picture, there was a tall clown in the background. The speed of the ride somewhat blurred his image, but I could see him just standing there, arms at his sides. In the hall of mirrors, the flash illuminated the face of a smiling clown in one mirror in the corner of the picture. There was something chillingly twisted about his expression. How many times did I collide into him thinking it was my girlfriend? And lastly, there was the picture of me standing next to the shooting gallery prize rack. There he was next to the octopus I grabbed for my girlfriend. I thought he was a doll. The realization made me absolutely sick. I was a hair's length away from him. His warm breath probably grazed my skin. What sort of sick delight did he get from doing this? I called up my girlfriend who was still asleep and asked her if she knew the clowns that were hired for the carnival. Her reply made me shudder. They got rid of clowns five years ago when parents complained that they were scaring the kids. I was camping with my best friend in the summer of 2006. We always went to the same area about 100 miles away from our hometown. Camping was our thing, our favorite thing to do. We always brought a bunch of food, drinks, and equipment. And one time, when we woke up in the morning and came out of our tent, all of our stuff was gone. So from then on, we would always set up a camera at night. We would skim through the usually boring footage the next day. Honestly, we never saw anything exciting. 
and never caught anyone stealing from our sight. But this one time, we were watching the footage while eating breakfast and were horrified to see a guy walk into our campsite and sit in a chair that was facing our tent. We watched the clock on the footage, and he sat there for 20 minutes. Then, without warning, the footage showed the man get up, walk over to our tent, and unzip it. He then climbed inside. As you can imagine, we were freaking out. Five minutes later, the man climbed back out and disappeared. I have no idea how we didn't wake up, and I have no idea what he did while he was in the tent with us. It literally makes me shiver every single time I think about it. Camping in Yellowstone National Park with my wife. It started pouring rain unexpectedly one night, and we were forced to ditch our tent and sleep in the SUV. It was thundering very loudly, and all of a sudden we hear a knock on the driver's side window. I wasn't looking at the window when it happened, and when I looked up at it, I saw no one. My first thought was that it was someone who needed something or needed help. Hesitantly, I rolled the window down. The rain was coming down hard, and it was so dark, I couldn't see anything. I yelled outside, Hello? But nobody responded, and a few seconds later, someone walked by my window towards the front of the car and circled around the front to the passenger side. My wife flipped out and locked the door. We could both see whoever it was stop by her door, and then they tried opening it. I rolled my window back up and locked my side, and seconds later, the person vanished. It was horrifying. I was on summer break and went camping with my friend and his parents. We went to the lake during the day and did the s'mores thing at night. His parents shared a tent while my friend and I had our own. I can't remember where the campsite was and I'm not really in contact with my friend anymore. But 15 years later, I'm assuming it wasn't the safest place to camp. Here's why. I woke up sometime in the early morning, like 3 or 4 a.m., and immediately saw a man's face looking in the tent at us. He had unzipped the door just enough to stick his head inside. He looked absolutely insane. He had big eyes and wild hair. I was so stiff from fear, I literally couldn't do anything. The man kept moving his head from left to right, very very slowly, as if it was uncontrollable. I guess my friend could hear me breathing loudly or something, because he woke up too. He had the same reaction as me, and just laid there in terror, looking at this mysterious man. I'm not certain how long he was sitting there looking at us, but it felt like hours, shaking his head back and forth. At some point, we heard a noise close by, and so did the man. He disappeared quick, and a couple minutes later we got out of our tent and woke up his parents. The guy was long gone. I'm still afraid of camping to this day. This happened to my friend Jane earlier this summer. Jane lives in a bungalow a block away from Green Lake in Seattle. For those of you unfamiliar, Green Lake is a really popular place for running, outdoor and park activities, dining, etc., and is super busy during the summer. It's common for people to be out late at night during the summer, so Jane didn't think anything was amiss when she heard noises outside her house at midnight. She woke up again around 3 a.m., but this time, the noises were louder, like something was hitting or tapping her house. She turned on all the lights and walked around her place but didn't see anything and went back to bed. She felt uneasy and didn't sleep well the rest of the night and woke up just before her alarm went off at 5 a.m. As she sat up in bed, 
she looked through her open bedroom door to see a man on all fours army crawling down the hall towards her bedroom. Jane screamed, and as she goes to grab her phone to call 911, the man calmly stands, looks at her, and says, Don't worry, I'm leaving. The man turned around and walked toward the front door. She shut her bedroom door and called the police. After the police arrived, she discovered the man had removed all of her window screens and presumably entered her home around the time she woke up at 3 a.m. The police did not believe he intended to rob her since he didn't take any of her valuables. The only things he did take were her car keys and her house keys that were in her purse by the front door. Jane's friend, a cop, believes the only reason this guy was so calm is because he has likely done this before. He also thinks that he had probably been watching her for some time and knew her schedule well enough to attack her when she was most defenseless. Whether he took her keys just to confuse her or because he intended to come back is beyond me. It was not uncommon back in the day for my mom to go to the store and leave me at home to watch TV. Nothing bad ever happened, but one time while watching TV, I heard the piano downstairs start to play. I just thought my mom was home, but was confused because she never played the piano. I went downstairs and walked into the room where the piano was. There was a crazy looking man sitting at the piano and was looking at me with a huge, exaggerated smile as soon as I entered the room. I was frozen, and he continued to smile and play the piano. He stopped suddenly, but never looked away from me. It was pure terror and shock. I finally somehow was able to move and ran. I ran out my front door, which was unlocked, and ran to the neighbor's house across the street. The lady that lived there was very concerned and I was surprised to see her walk over to my house by herself and go inside. And I was even more surprised when she came back out with the man. Apparently, the man was her mentally disabled brother, about 50 years old. I never saw him again, but I can remember his crazy exaggerated smile like it just happened yesterday. When I was 22, I was dating a guy that lived out in the country, pretty far away from where I lived. It was about 60 miles out, and while driving to his house one day, the sun started going down. It was about 8 p.m. It was still bright enough outside to see, but almost to the point where I needed my lights on. As I'm driving down this long stretch of road, I see something off in the distance. As I came a bit closer, I could see it was another car, a small red Toyota. It was stopped and turned kind of sideways in the opposite lane. When I came closer, I was horrified to see a woman lying face down in the middle of the road. I came to a stop about 30 feet away and grabbed my cell phone. I forgot that I didn't have any reception out here and I sat thinking of what to do for a few minutes. Even though there was nothing that seemed threatening about the situation, I felt scared. I didn't want to leave my car. And I realized I had no way of providing any kind of help anyway, so I decided to drive past the body and keep going. And when I got to the store about 20 miles away, I would get some help. So I started to drive by the body very slowly, going about 2 miles per hour. And when I was sure I cleared the body, I hit the gas. Only about five seconds go by and I look in the rearview mirror. The body is now standing up in the middle of the road, facing me. I'm laying in bed reading with my dog at night. My bedroom door is open and my room is the only room in the house with the lights on. It's completely silent. I took a quick glance at my dog my dog is staring out the door into pure darkness. I see him slowly tilting his head to the side, which he only does when he sees or hears something that seems bizarre. Then he slowly stands up and starts growling and snarling towards the dark hallway. 
I start to call his name, but he ignores me, and his growling is becoming more and more aggressive. I stand up next to him and look out the door, but I can't see anything, it's so dark. He then starts to bark. I look down at him, and he is definitely staring at something in the hallway. I lean down to pet him, and as soon as I touch his head, he stops. His mouth opens, and he starts panting while wagging his tail. It was so unnerving. I'm going to tell this story for my grandpa, since he is no longer with us. He told me a long time ago that he was living in Hawaii, and one weekend day, he was at the beach with some of his friends and a group of girls. He said they were all swimming and having a great time and that he and a pretty girl had hit it off and went for a walk down the beach. The stretch of beach was terribly long, according to my grandpa, and they walked all the way down the beach until nobody else was in sight, and they eventually had to stop walking on the sand when they hit some huge rocks. My grandpa says they swam out into the water and around the rocks, and were amazed and excited to see a hidden area on the other side of them. They swam over to the sand behind the rocks and kept walking. The way my grandpa put it, they were walking and saw a person laying in the sand. Him and the girl both knew right away somehow that the person was dead. The girl became scared and wanted to turn back but my grandpa kept going, and she followed. He says that when they got to the person, they were horrified to see it was a woman covered in blood who had looked to have been stabbed many times. He says at that time, the woman vomited, and here's the weirdest part of the story. I'm not sure why he told me this, but he said he briefly thought that this would be a damn good place to stab someone to death and that it was a good thing he didn't have any knives on hand. He laughed after telling me that and then said they just walked away and told their friends. He never told the police department and isn't sure that any of them did. All right, so it was summer and my two best friends and I just finished our shopping for the camping trip. We were all 16, and my friend's dad was taking us. It was quite a long drive, and we arrived about four hours after we had left. We set up a couple of tents, and it was already getting dark by the time we finished. We made a fire in the pit and ate dinner. We stayed up late that night talking, and my friend's dad even let the three of us drink beer. We finally went to sleep after talking and screwing around for hours. The next morning we woke up early, and breakfast was already being made. My friend's dad had told us about a waterfall he had seen a long time ago that he was sure was nearby. He said he went swimming in the water below the waterfall, and that it was secluded and really cool. He said we would have to go on a hike to get there, and I was looking forward to seeing that waterfall more than the others, and I really wanted to go swimming. After breakfast, we changed into some hiking clothes, grabbed our swim trunks, and walked off into the direction of the supposed waterfall. Three minutes into the hike, we were walking through the woods and saw a very small shack or something like that that somebody had built. It looked very old, it was run down and falling apart. We of course became curious and started walking over towards it. That's when we saw him, a clown standing in the open doorway of the shack. The three of us stopped dead in our tracks and didn't know what to do or what to say. I can't really speak for them, but at first I wanted to laugh. But then terror quickly swept over me because of the realization that this was completely messed up. Why the hell would there be a clown out here? The clown stood there like a statue, and it was obvious that he was trying to scare us. Then, he started running in our direction, 
and we of course turned around and ran. All three of us fell and tripped over each other because of the adrenaline and how scared we were. We made it back to camp and stared in the direction we had just come from, but he never emerged from the trees. My friend's dad said he believed us when we told him, but I don't think he really did. He was way too calm about it. The three of us freaked out and laughed about it after a while, but I think about it whenever I hang out with the two of them, and we always bring it up. This was nine years ago, and I still think about it whenever I think of them or see a clown. What the hell was he doing out there? Planning to kidnap or murder someone? Was he just sitting out there, waiting for people to see him? The most horrific night of my life. Halloween 2010. My cousin Chris and I were roommates at the time, and we had just moved in together two months before Halloween. We were pretty well known in our town, and wanted to throw a Halloween party at our new place. We spent the day getting the party ready, buying drinks and food, and setting up spider webs and other decorations. It was a pretty good time. I dressed up as a mad doctor, and Chris dressed up as a clown. He was the life of the party, and was doing ridiculous clown-like things to make everyone laugh. I was 18, and wasn't really used to drinking very much, but at that party, that night, I drank a lot. I started with beer, but then started taking shots with people. I can't really remember when people started to leave, but I think it was around 2 or 3 in the morning. I remember being so drunk that I couldn't move from the chair I was sitting in in the living room. I was so drunk, people started leaving and I didn't even notice or care. I was just watching TV. I kind of remember Chris telling me he was going out to buy some alcohol for some people, and then I passed out. The next thing I remember is waking up to Chris coming back, walking through the garage door, and sitting on the couch opposite of me. The whole room was spinning fast and I could not keep my vision still enough to focus on anything. I remember asking Chris if he bought the booze, and he just shook his head no. After that I just remember going in and out of consciousness. My phone was ringing, but I ignored it. I was too drunk and tired to reach into my pocket and answer it. But it kept ringing, over and over and over. I finally pulled it out and hit the green button on the screen. Yeah, I said into the phone drunkenly. Then I heard Chris's voice say, Shit dude, finally. We were just about to leave. We're at Jack in the Box. Do you want anything? In my drunken state I didn't put it together right away, but I remember looking over at Chris on the couch. But the room was spinning so much I couldn't make out his face. Just the bright colors from his costume. I then said to Chris sitting on the couch, Dude, stop. I think I'm gonna throw up. Stop calling me. Just stop. He said nothing back, and then I heard Chris's voice on the phone say, Later, and he hung up. I sat there for a minute, barely able to think, but then somehow I had a moment of clarity. I realized that I heard girls in the background on the phone, and then I put it together. I sat up on the chair and then stood up on my feet. Whoever was sitting on the couch in front of me was a complete blur, so I started walking over to him. Each step was extremely difficult. I stopped in front of him, squinted my eyes, and put my hands on the side of my head. It worked. It steadied my vision, and I could clearly see the older man sitting on the couch, smiling at me. I asked him who the hell he was, and then he got up and walked past me. I stood there facing the couch, unable to turn around. That's the last thing I remember. The next thing I knew, I woke up in a hospital, and I felt a very different kind of drunk. I asked a random nurse standing near me where I was and what the hell was going on, and she told me, that I had been attacked. About 24 hours later, 
I was finally thinking clearly again when I woke up. Chris, my sisters, my parents were all in the room. I asked what happened again, and Chris said that he found me laying on the living room floor in a puddle of blood. They were as confused as I was, but I tried to tell them that I thought that it was Chris in the room with me. They didn't understand, but I told them there was a man. There was a man in the house. It was a clown. Six years ago, I had a group of friends that always hung out together. My girlfriend at the time was also a part of this group. One day I get a phone call from the cops and they tell me my girlfriend is at the police station because she found a body at our friend Jessica's house. She went over to Jessica's house to pick her up and found her in a pool of blood in her bedroom. She was stabbed repeatedly by her boyfriend who was also a part of our group. It was shocking, but over time, she got over seeing what she did, and we moved on. That is, until one day I picked up her phone while she was in her backyard gardening and started looking through her photos. I stumbled onto an unbelievably gruesome picture. She had taken a close-up picture of Jessica before the cops picked her up, her face was mangled completely. I left her house immediately and took the phone to the cops. It was a crazy situation. I was told later that she also stole some of Jessica's jewelry. From that day on, I've had this disturbing feeling that she might have had something to do with Jessica's murder. I was on my way home from work years ago, riding the subway as I always did. The subway was always packed, but I had managed to find a seat this day. As I was sitting there, people watching, I felt something stuffed in between the seat and the window. I looked down and it was an envelope. I pulled it out and it was sealed. There was nothing written on it and I of course opened it. There was a small slip of paper folded in half. I pulled it out and read the single sentence printed on it. I've killed 16 people. Back in the 60s and the 70s, my family lived in Chatsworth, California. The town was at the foot of the Santa Susana Mountains which seemed to be a wonderful wilderness playground to all of the kids in the area. Brown's Canyon Road wound up the mountains, with maybe only two houses along its six or seven miles. It really was a beautiful area with a stream, wildflowers, and live oaks, and the local teens liked to party up there at night. One night, a bunch of teens were sitting by the stream the starlight, the rippling noise of the water, and the warm summer night. All were made even more intense by the fact that they were stoned on LSD. One of the boys leaned back on his hands where he was sitting in the dirt. Lost in thought, he started running his hand over something behind him. It was bumpy in a regular sort of way, so his fingers made kind of a rhythm. Bump. 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 After a while, he finally turned to see what it was. He had his hand in the mouth of a decapitated girl. He had been running his hands over her teeth over and over again. That was the bump. 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 The poor girl had been chopped up and dumped along the stream with some dirt thrown over her and the kids were sitting on her. Of course, they all freaked out, but I heard that the kid who found her never came down from his acid trip. I can't verify that part, but I do know we didn't see him around that area again. The entire neighborhood was spooked for quite some time.
In fifth grade, coming back inside from recess, I found a note in my desk. It read, I am going to kill you. I showed it to my teacher, and she tried getting the person who wrote it to come forward by scolding the entire class, but nobody ever admitted to doing it. The next day, coming back from recess, I found a note that said the same thing in the same handwriting. The teacher tried to compare the writing with everyone in the class, and she contacted my parents and the principal, but nothing became of it. Three years later, in eighth grade, at a different school, I was finishing up my third period gym class. I went into the locker room to change back into my school clothes. When I opened my locker, a note fell to the floor. I picked it up and read it. My blood turned ice cold as I read the same words in the same handwriting. Please welcome my friend, Mortis Media. Are you ready for the darkness to take control? This started when my two brothers, David and Luke, and Luke's girlfriend, Sarah, all drove down to the desert to spend some time in the country. This is reservation land, as it were, so red dirt everywhere. We had some pistols and decided to go target practice. We took our gear and some old targets to this place called Devil's Heartbeat. I had never been before, but the three of them were familiar with the area. It was a canyon about 200 feet deep, and we stayed on one end of the canyon by the drop-offs, and to our left was a ravine and about 50 feet over, the opposite side of the canyon rose up above us. On the opposite end, there were some Anasazi ruins. The Navajo may disagree with historians on the Anasazi's origins and departure, as according to the Navajo, they simply disappeared from existence, leaving behind plates, dishes, and food and went into another dimension, or some equivalent. But whatever the history, the Navajo do not like to wander into Anasazi ruins. I never asked why, but figured it had something to do with disrespect or preserving history. As such, none of the others cared a bit about these canyon ruins. They were more interested in shooting pistols. I could see old beds, ladders, and even cave drawings on the cliffs with my naked eye. And I got this strange fixation going over me. I'm not Navajo, and felt that their rules didn't apply to me. I set off down the cliffs with a rope, and decided I would climb down, cross the canyon floor, and then climb back up. This was a bad idea for a million reasons, but it was like an obsession. I can't explain the feeling, it was like magnetism. I wanted to be in those ruins, and it wasn't just some touristy curiosity. I felt as if I were meant to go there. I kept slipping and getting stuck on the rocks. I was so frustrated I started crying. Finally, I was deterred by the unmistakable sound of a growl coming from the canyon floor below me. There were trees down there so I couldn't see what was making the growl, but Mountain Lion immediately rose to mind, and I got my ass back up the cliffside. I said nothing to the others, and we shut the guns for a while. The only other strange occurrence was that while Sarah was aiming, things got eerily quiet. We all heard sounds from around us, behind us, maybe 20 feet away. It was like a growl, then a hoarse laugh, almost like a lion and then a hyena. We had a clear view of the entire area, and there was nothing, certainly not on the clifftops where we heard it anyway. The creepiest part was that while David, Sarah and I all heard it from a close distance, 
Luke heard the exact same noise right by his ear. We ended up camping out to see if anything would happen, and this is when things got completely terrifying. Before, I was only scared of wild animals. We had guns though, and were sleeping with no bags nor tents. Just some blankets under the stars with a little fire. So I felt safe when we had all laid down, and I fell asleep pretty quickly. I woke up a few hours later, to see everyone else laying down with their eyes wide open, listening. The canyon was completely full of noises. The only way to describe it is people banging rocks together. There would be one set, maybe 300 yards away, then another clacking 200 yards away, and then 50 feet away. The canyon echoes, so it was hard to tell exactly how many rock smacking noises there were, but they sounded like Morse code. We listened for perhaps 10 minutes. No other animal noises. No nothing. Finally, David, who was a hard ass and the least superstitious of his family, shouted, Shut up! And everything immediately stopped. My heart was in my throat. We just sat there and stared at each other wide eyed. It was dead quiet. And then we heard another super weird set of noises from the Anasazi ruins. I don't know how to explain this one either. But it almost sounded like a zebra. And then the rock slash stick slash whatever started up again. But this was worse. Because now other animal noises came in. We heard what sounded like wolves or coyotes barking. Monkeys screeching, owls hooting and those terrible zebra noises. We said nope. We got our happy little asses out of there immediately. It took us maybe 10 minutes to douse the fire, pack our blankets and speed away, with the noises continuing the entire time. That night, I was obviously pretty shaken. Before I could fall asleep again, my Navajo mother came and sat by me, and said that she could tell I had a rough day. We hadn't mentioned the creepy shit to avoid a lecture about messing around with the spirits. She asked me about it, and I ended up spilling my guts about not seeing the canyon ruins. It was something personal. I felt like I wanted to go there. Why couldn't I go? It would have been beautiful. After I word vomited all over her, I could see that she had a really concerned look over her face. What is it? I asked, totally confused, and she explained something I had no idea about. The spirits in the ruins like to lure people. When they get up to the ground, the spirits push them off. That's why we don't go there. I remained creeped out for the remainder of the visit. The town has a public accessible kiva, kind of like a tourist trap for little podunk places. But since I didn't see the ruins up close, I went down via the kiva, and I went alone, as of course my superstitious family refused to enter other natives' dwellings. I figured that nothing could push me off a cliff if I were in a kiva. I was right, but something even worse happened. Fast forward a few weeks later, I worked at a shitty call centre in Salt Lake City, third shift. It was my first night alone and I was feeling jumpier than ever since the kiva. My brothers already warned me that I had a skinwalker following me, but I of course did not believe it. I don't smoke, but I follow my co-workers out for smoke breaks because I liked the chat. Tonight I lurked in the doorway, because I had this horrible cloud of dread hanging over me. I was peeping out of the glass door, and being a total weirdo, it hit me then how paranoid I had been. That's what skinwalkers do. They mess around with your mind. Whilst I was pacing in front of the glass door, I decided that this whole thing was stupid, and I was going to go outside and stand there for the rest of my 10 minute break. Most of the smokers were already filing back in, but I walked out, put my hands in my pockets and looked at the sky. I looked at the building, 
mentally patting myself on the back for not being a pussy. Then I saw something I will never be able to have a rational explanation for. We have six parking lots. In one of the lots far away from me, perhaps a hundred feet away, I could see something walking. It was like a dog, obviously, but it was almost limping and walked like it were tired or hurt. Animal lover me forgot about skinwalkers and I started walking towards it, making the ch 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 come here doggy noises. And then I stopped abruptly. The dog had the body form of a greyhound and it was grey, but there was something really wrong with it. It had bloody legs and limped, but it walked more like a person would on their feet and hands. Its butt was moving to and fro and didn't make any sense. When it heard me, it just stopped without turning, something I've never known any dog to do. And finally, it looked over its shoulder at me. And this is the freakiest part. The dog was looking at me the way a person does. It had huge eyes, way too big for a greyhound, and its teeth were barred as if it was considering biting me. Then it growled, but it was like a whistle growl, noises no regular animals make. It almost sounded like it wanted to talk to me, or that it was taunting me. Somehow in the middle of all of this, I realised it didn't have a tail and I'd heard from all the Navajo stories that skinwalkers, when they appear as animals, don't have tails. Screw all logic and rationality. I turned and jetted. I didn't look back until I was inside the building and had pulled the door shut behind me. And when I looked back, of course, it was gone. When I described this to my brothers, they were absolutely sure it was a skinwalker. I then went through the trouble of blessing me my apartment, them, and their apartments. I never saw the creepy bloody dog again, and have ever since never slightly wanted to visit those cliff ruins. I began babysitting at 13 to earn extra money to spend on horribly embarrassing things like Fall Out Boy CDs. I would almost always work for my father's clients, he's a lawyer, and get referred by word of mouth. I was babysitting for one family who had a little girl of nine, and a little boy of seven. The parents seemed okay, a tad crotchety, giving me a full schedule to follow and jokingly threatening to beat any boy who might mysteriously show up after they left. It felt cruel for them to accuse me of even knowing a boy, given that I basically looked like an overgrown baby with frizzy hair at my age. Almost immediately after the parents leave, the little girl sings in a creepy high-pitched voice, We're all alone now. Righto, cue the Shining soundtrack. I know, the little boy chimed in. Let's play rape. Looking back now, I know the kid probably just heard that term on TV and knew the word was shocking and said it just for a reaction. I totally bought into it at the time, sputtering wide-eyed and changing the subject quickly. These kids were hell for the next hour. I wouldn't let them watch South Park on the TV because their parents did not seem to allow their precious nine and seven year olds to watch a show like that. As soon as I said no, the little girl said casually, oh, that's fine. We'll just go play PlayStation in the family room. Feel free to watch it out here. I knew exactly what was headed. I said to them that they could go watch any other TV show in the living room whilst I made them dinner. The parents had left instructions to make them sandwiches. I could handle that. Before I'd even got the bread out, I hear a massive crash. It seems like the little girl had broken a glass. Tutting and pissed, but ultimately with no way of punishing her, I cleaned it up 
whilst the two incredibly weird kids watched with wide eyes. So I dumped the broken glass into the trash and went back to making the sandwiches. I'm a vegetarian, so whilst the children had chicken, I made a simple salad sandwich for myself. Just as I was finishing, the little boy screamed out in what sounded like a pantomime of pain. Nonetheless, I ran over to the couch in the living room to check on him. My ankle, he howled, dramatically flopping back into the couch. While I tried to figure out how he had hurt his ankle, the little girl slipped out of the room. Peripherally, I was aware of this, but didn't really pay it any mind and focused on the little boy pretending to be in pain. He kept saying, I went to stand, but it hurt too much. I don't know, over and over, until his eyes suddenly flicked to just behind me, where I could see the little girl standing with a perturbing smile on her face. It was a miracle he was healed. At this point, I was just thinking these kids were very strange and craved attention a little too much and probably needed more parental involvement, but whatever. I was 13 and that $60 was only four hours away. I set out the sandwiches for the two to eat at the dining table and I went to get a soda and returned. After pouring soda for both of them, I realized that they hadn't taken a bite out of their sandwiches yet. I asked them what they were waiting for. They smiled. For you to take a bite out of yours. I am so glad I had a gut feeling to open my sandwich. Because when I did, I saw glass. Broken glass. The broken glass that I had put in the trash. I stared in horror at these two little children. Staring at me. Giving me maniacal grins. I lost it, shouting, are you too serious? At the very least, you could have really injured my mouth. What's wrong with you? Instead of crying or apologizing, or pretending to be ashamed or confused, these two little kids began laughing. And not a childish laugh either. It was a low and threatening laugh. I'll never forget that noise. My immediate reaction was that these kids are too young to be laughing like that. I called my older sister who was 17 at the time, told her over the phone what happened and cried about it a little. She came and took over for me. We left the house with chills after the parents arrived. I never babysat for those two again. What I can't get past is the level of predetermination that went into sprinkling that broken glass into my sandwich and the total remorseless way that they responded to me being upset. They were unlike any two kids I've ever met before or since. I was a new nurse at our hospital and had only been working there for a couple of months. I had bought a patient of mine up from day surgery from the ER for an endoscopy and they called me back down and asked me to bring up her family as she didn't speak enough English to communicate and we needed her consent for a procedure. After dropping them off, I walked past the waiting room and headed back down the hall to the elevators. I took the way back to get to the ER and all the hallways were deserted. You see, this used to be the paediatric wing of the hospital, but it has been shut down for years and all the rooms are deserted, full of broken equipment, beds and just general crap. As I reached the nurses station at the T-junction, between the paediatric hallway and the hallway that goes down to the elevators, I saw a little girl standing across from the nurses station further down the hall. She had big pigtails and was wearing a brown dress and white shoes, 
holding a teddy bear. I thought perhaps she was a family member who had walked away from the day surgery waiting room. I was concerned that she would go into one of these rooms and might get hurt or lost. So I said, hey little girl, what are you doing? You don't need to be over here, you're going to get hurt. And I walked around the nurse's station so that I could grab her hand and bring her back. I shit you not. As I got about 15 feet away from her, she vanished. Every hair on my body stood up straight, and I turned and ran like a bat out of hell to the elevator. I pounded that button for what seemed like an eternity, until the elevator got to the floor I was on. As I got back to the ER, I walked up to the nurse's desk, and one of the older nurses looked at me and said, Jeez, what's wrong with you? I remember babbling like an idiot as I tried to tell them what happened. After listening to me for a moment or two, the nurse said, Oh, you saw the little ghost girl. Yeah, she's been around here for years. And I remember replying, Well, thanks for telling me about this before. Apparently the ghost has been here ever since the ER, ducking in and out of patients' rooms and peeking around curtains. My wife worked up on the seventh floor and said that one time on nights, a whole row of patients started yelling about a little girl that was running around in the rooms. I guess she gets around. I was working at an 100 year old abandoned farmhouse several years ago. My co-worker and I were told to find the well for the house, since they were thinking about developing the property. After looking for a while, we figured it might be in the old house. I grabbed my flashlight and we headed in through a window that wasn't boarded up very well. The place was creepy. The second floor had a burnt goat carcass and pentagrams drawn in ash all over the walls. So that started the chills and goosebumps. We eventually made our way to the basement, where I almost fell into the very deep well at the end of the steps. I'm not sure how deep it was, but our 25 inch tape wouldn't hit the bottom. Anyway, my curiosity was still running wild, so we went searching around the basement. My co-worker noticed that one of the stone walls didn't make it all the way up to the ceiling, and it was probably a fake wall. Good call on his part. He boosted me over the wall, and I helped him climb over. The first room was empty, and had nothing exciting. Just dark, wet, and cold. Looking around, there was another wall with an opening. I decided to go first, and I was boosted over the wall. My co-worker thought it would be funny to hang onto the flashlight for a while, whilst I stumbled in the dark. Finally, he tossed it over to me, and that's when I began freaking out. The room had chains built into the walls, with wrists and ankle shackles. The walls had scratch marks from nails, and I'm guessing that someone tried to escape. I lasted about 30 seconds in that room, before I started to dash over both walls and the well, right out of the window we climbed through to get into that creepy house. I don't think it was just the shackles or the scratch marks that creeped me out, but the ice cold chills that shot down my spine, like there was something truly evil lurking in that place. This is a story that I'm not supposed to be telling. A family secret that I'm not supposed to know about. When my grandfather was younger, he became the principal of an elementary school. He was in his late twenties, early thirties at the time. And despite being young, 
He was a born leader. He was a great principal, and everyone loved him. I can attest to that, as I attended multiple award ceremonies for him, and the respect and admiration he received was crazy. There was a young boy at the school who was having behavioural issues in class, and my grandfather saw the kid didn't have a lot of parental support. So he called the father and had a talk with him about spending more time with his son and just a general parenting session. It turned out that all the boy needed was his dad's attention and after a few weeks he was happy and was a model student. Whenever my grandfather would leave school late he would see the dad was playing basketball with his son after he got home from work. It was one of those moments that he took pride in, being able to make a difference in people's lives. However, not everything had such an easy solution, and my grandfather found himself having to deal with an employee, Stanley the janitor, who was showing up for work drunk. Stanley was an alcoholic, with a mean streak, and my grandfather tried on multiple occasions to deal with his behaviour. Finally though, Stanley one day showed up so drunk that my grandfather sent him home and called the superintendent to let him know that he was going to fire him the next morning. After he sobered up, he then warned them to let him deal with Stanley when he was sober because he was not a stable person. As it goes in these kind of stories, the superintendent was furious and decided that he was going to call Stanley himself and fire him, despite my grandfather's warning. No one called my grandfather to tell him about it either, so he was completely in the dark and thought that he would just deal with it in the morning. Stanley was furious and went to the school that evening. He searched the offices, my grandfather's included, and tore things apart until finally he had what he wanted. He was in a blaze of fury, and on his way out, he saw the father and son playing basketball. He walked towards them, and pulled something out of his trousers. It was a gun. He then proceeded to shoot the little boy, killing him instantly. The father was so upset, and was crying hysterically. But somehow, he managed to get the gun away from Stanley and shot him. My grandfather was called to the elementary school immediately by police because there were two dead bodies, the little boys and Stanley's. But what was even worse was the crying from the father and him saying that he couldn't save his son. It was clear that he would never forgive himself for that day. My grandfather was pulled aside by one of the police who had searched Stanley for evidence. They had found a list, a hit list of people that he was going to kill and all the addresses of the people that he had received when he was searching the offices. My grandfather was number one on that list. So if it wasn't for that father, it's likely that I would have never been able to meet my grandfather and possibly my mother and grandmother would have been killed if Stanley had been able to complete his mission. To this day, I get goosebumps whenever I hear that story, and it's just so chilling. My grandfather never uttered a single word about this, after his initial recount to my mother, and she made me swear to never tell him that I knew. He carried the weight of that boy's death until the day he died. So Stanley, I'm glad we never had to meet, and that you were stopped before you could cause more harm.